just a cute little veil style I did today. And what I do is I have a wig cap on. I have my hair twisted up. Whenever I wash my hair, I just twist it up or you can cornrow it. And I take this little piece of the scarf and I kind of just tuck it under this do-rag or the uh, wig cap. So I can kind of give off the illusion of a... Uh, like this. <laughs> um... Well, I wanted to make this video to encourage you about your weight with something God has promised you, regardless of what it may be. And um, just what I've been experiencing lately. Um, one thing that God has been teaching me about seasons or that he has taught me is that um, there's different phases to different seasons. And prophetically, sometimes when God shows you something, it can feel like it's really right at the door or it's about to happen really, really soon. That's because in the spirit, there's no um, there's no concept of time. So it can feel like that in the spirit. But um, it could also just be the Lord introducing you to one phase of the promise that he gave you. But it's not really may not be time for it to manifest or really give birth yet. It's kind of like trimesters. It's just like trimesters with a pregnancy. How we have first second and third trimester where well, we have different phases to seasons so god can tell you that it may be the season for your promise to come to pass but um you could be in phase one of it you could be in phase two and maybe phase three it's gonna come like probably five six months later you know something like that so um <clears throat> what i have experienced with satan and what he likes to do he discourages you he discourages you throughout the whole wait <laughs> so it really does not matter but when you get to trimester or phase three of your promise Satan will do he will go above and beyond to discourage you about that word and this is why I really want to stress in this video how important it is for you to believe what God told you when God speaks to you about something especially if it's a very delicate word it's a very delicate promise you have to literally ignore and just tune out every other voice even Christians because if the Lord will do the Lord is his responsibility to confirm his word. He's not going to confirm somebody else's word. He's not going to confirm your word and what you want God to do and what you're probably delusional about believing God for that he never even told you. He's not going to confirm that. He's going to confirm what he told you by his spirit. And he is going to send witnesses for that promise that he gave you. But he's going to be the one to send those witnesses to you. You don't go looking for people to agree with the word that God gave you. It's not going to happen. So, um... What I have learned is it really is like it's so important for you to just tune everybody else out. Um, I, I think along the way there will be some people that you get really excited uh, about and you want to like tell them the promise and share the promise with them and stuff. <clears throat> and um, that's going to happen and you will probably, you know, bump into some people who may not agree with your word or your promise. They just don't believe it. Like I said, everybody doesn't have the grace to believe what, what God told you. It's not their word. It's your word. So not that it could always do harm, it could just, um, it could probably hinder your faith a little bit. And I feel like, I feel like that does do harm. I feel like if you're faithless, that is harmful because faith is what God needs to even move in your life when anything he told you, you walk into the promise by faith. So if you have people that you're sharing this word and this promise with who you know for a fact don't believe you or they don't agree with your promise, then um, that's a hindrance to your promise in the first place because, you know, they can break down that faith that God is trying to build up through the weight. And um, like I said in the older video, God's promises is for y'all's relationship. Um, we are not, we shouldn't have faith in the promise itself. Our faith is in God because he's the one who gave you the promise in the first place. God's promises to us is just so that he can continually prove himself to us and build up our faith and trust in him so that it can um it can increase and really um establish our relationship with him because the more that god proves himself to you with things that he told you the more you're going to trust him that he is who he says he is that he is trustworthy that he does have this uh righteous character he um he's not a man that he should lie pretty much everything the bible says but god likes to demonstrate that to you as well if he's going to have a healthy relationship with you he's a gentleman he's going to do it the way any other gentleman would do he's going to take time to spend time with you take you out, you know, get to know you, and prove himself to you. That's what any gentleman would do. So that's what God likes to do with us. Even though we have his word, he still likes to demonstrate his word. And there's always signs and confirmations following God's word, not somebody else's word. Satan can give false signs and confirmations too. That's a whole different, that's a different video. We're talking about the Lord's word <laughs> right now, okay? So, um... That's what God's promises are for. So I feel like, you know, even though God may have given you a promise or a word for something, like don't get distracted and become so obsessed with the promise that you just kind of throw God out the window. Because number one, um, like I said, you know, your faith is not even in the promise. It's in God. 
God's promises are his secrets to you that he reveals to you. You know, he says he's not going to do anything in his word unless he reveals it to his prophets first. And he calls us his friends. We're servants and friends. So um, God's promises or things that he reveals to you is really just um, it's his secret. And um, one way to encourage y'all when it comes to believing what God told you is it's the same as if we were to share each other's secrets today. You can't tell me that my secret that I shared with you is a lie because it's my secret. <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense for you to say We'd be like, hey, can you keep a secret? And you're like, yeah, what is it? And I'll tell you what my secret is. And you're just like, I don't believe that. that I mean, it wouldn't make sense. So, so it's literally the same thing with God. God can't lie. So that already goes out the window that um, whatever he told you, you know, can't be trusted. You obviously it can't be trusted if God cannot lie. So the second reason why it would be just, just um, silly to not believe God is because it's his secret that he shared with you. You are just a byproduct of that secret. You're going to play a part in um, either walking into that promise or having a piece of that promise. Or maybe God just made you a witness to that promise. It could be somebody else's promise. Or maybe it could be just a prophecy that God has made you a witness to that you know about. Like, for example, who Obama is. <laughs> that's, that's one example. So um, it's very silly for us to doubt the voice of God and his revelations because it's his secret. You can't tell somebody that their secret isn't true. Um... The main issue with us is just having a heart of unbelief, and this is why God gives us promises, so that he can increase your faith, because he knows that the more he builds you up in that faith, the more that you believe those signs and those confirmations that he gave you by his spirit, and uh, the more that you bear witness to and you recognize the witnesses that he sends for that word, there's always going to be a witness, always. If you don't have a witness for what God told you, it's not God. It's not. Simply because this is just how he does things. <laughs> I mean, there's a witness for everything. I mean, from the beginning, you know, even the Old Testament, they always had witnesses for God's word. Jesus had witnesses, you know, he had his disciples for his word, for his gospel. He had witnesses. They say that in the book of Acts and all the different um, letters of the Bible, you know, Peter always says, you know, we saw and believe. We walk with him. You know, we saw him do these things. So they are witnesses. Jesus chose apostles and the apostles actually chose a replacement. When Judas died, when they were going to choose another apostle, they said, we need to choose somebody who was here from the beginning who actually witnessed Jesus do these things. So God's not always going to have his word, Jesus. <laughs> He's not ever going to have his word just like a loner. It's not going to be alone. It's always going to have signs and confirmations following it by his Holy Spirit, and it's always going to have witnesses, period, point blank. So, um... Yes, it's very silly for us to accuse God of lying about his own secret. We have a heart problem. That's why we can't believe God, which is why he gives you the promise to increase your faith and your relationship with him because he wants the opportunity to demonstrate and to prove himself to you. Um, that's not the same thing as signs. You know um, You know how the Bible says a wicked generation seeks after a sign. Well, we're not a wicked generation, okay? We're the saints of God. We'll be, we're becoming saints because saints mean sanctified when we're being sanctified. But we're not a wicked generation. We're not seeing God do all these things and knowing it's him and still hardening our hearts. That's what that scripture was talking about. God has no problem giving you a sign of confirmation for anything. But... Um, yeah, so let God prove himself to you. And one thing I want to encourage all about, don't set your heart on the promise. Set your heart on the promise in the sense that, you know, you're receiving this gift from God. You're very happy about it. He does want your hope and your promise to, he does want your hope and your faith in the promise to a certain degree to where you are constantly hoping and looking forward to the manifestation of this thing. Just like the rapture, you know, he tells us that encourage each other with these words that the Lord is coming back so we should have our faith in the promise to some degree but not separate from God if that makes sense because a lot of people I've personally done this we get so obsessed with the promise that we just kind of ignore God we stop spending time with him or we just want that thing that God showed us and we don't really care too much about the Lord and it's like well that's the that's the main purpose and you even getting the promises is for your relationship with him the, you know the promise is just a byproduct of God you know so don't get distracted by that. Um, okay, what else was I going to say? With God's promises. Yes, please, for the love of God, I cannot stress to you enough. Do not have your ears and your heart open to man with this word. I don't care if they're a Christian, because let me tell you something. 
Christians are still vessels and servants of God. They can be used for the wrong thing or they can be used for the right thing. And by that, I mean, if God sees that your heart is more set on you getting your faith from this person and you all, you constantly need somebody to agree with this word that God gave you, God can deceive you through that person. He can give them a false dream or he can give them um, a false word, a false prophecy. And because you're more dependent on that person than you are God about that word, he can deceive you through that person. I'm about to read that in Ezekiel 14. Which the context is a little different, but it's, it's still kind of the same concept. But um, we are not dependent on man for anything. We acknowledge that God uses people. He can use man for our confirmation through his hand. But we don't go to people for nothing. You don't go to people for nothing. People, Christians cannot confirm God's word to you any more than they could anything else. You know, they can only do that by his spirit anyway. So you can't be dependent on somebody else to receive from God for you if you can't even do it for yourself. Because, I mean, anything they do tell you, they would have to get from him, not in and of themselves. So um, believe what God told you. His spirit is going to be speaking to you in so many different ways. You need to catch it. You need to write it down. And you need to jot down and document all of those confirmations because it's going to build up your faith and encourage your heart for your weight until that thing is manifested. I would not have my heart or my ear open to anything contrary to what God told me, period. And if somebody's in your life who's doing that, I would cut them off immediately. That's a serpent, or the enemy is using them. It could be a brother or sister in the Lord. It really does not matter. We don't have room. When it comes to a delicate word like that, what God gives us, we don't have room for naysayers. We're not cursing them. We're not being ugly towards them. We just don't have room for them. You are going to hinder me from walking into my promised land. I don't want to hear anything you have to say that's contrary to what I know for a fact that God told me. You can leave. Enjoy your relationship with God. I'm going to enjoy mine. Like, you don't, don't play with stuff like that. And another thing I want to say is concerning encouragement for your weight. Your promise is much bigger than you. And by that, I mean, sometimes we uh, we find ourselves getting really frustrated. We start complaining because we're waiting so, so long for this to be manifested. And like I said, it's God's promise. It's not yours. He's just sharing it with you and he's giving it to you as a gift. So it's God's responsibility and his, it's his job to bring that promise to pass. He just shared it with you. So you are believing with God for that promise. You have no control over how it manifests or when it manifests. Or who it manifests with, okay? You don't control anything. And we always operate in a spirit of witchcraft and manipulation with something that God told us. And we try to force that word and try to make it happen before it's time. And that, that's not God's will. God has everything set up for an appointed time that he wants to happen. It does not matter what the enemy tries to do. It's always going to serve God's purpose somehow. He's just going to look stupid every time. So I wouldn't even worry about what Satan is doing. We can clearly see that in uh, Exodus uh, with Moses, he tried to kill Moses or tried to get uh, have the baby killed. Just Satan has just done so many stupid things, crazy things over the years, and it's always failed miserably. So that should tell you, God just uses Satan as a vessel of dishonor. Satan has no real power or authority to halt anything in God's will. The only thing that can halt God's promise in your life is, um, since God does use Satan, your unbelief your unbelief and you not trusting God he will turn you over to the curse and then Satan can devour you that way but truthfully both God and Satan know Satan really has no power over your promise God just he's testing that word in your heart God gave you that word he knows that in his word he told you to trust him and you believe him you believe his words and when he promised you he will allow Satan to deceive you and to tempt you and to discourage you directly through visions and dreams through false naysayers false prophets false witnesses um, enemies, you know, he'll, he'll discourage you in many different ways, but God only allows Satan to do that because he's testing your heart to see if she's still going to believe what I told her. And, you know, Satan can project all this fear concerning your promise into your heart, all that he wants to, but, uh, he still has no authority to halt anything. The only thing that can halt it and put you under the curse, which Satan has authority over, Satan has authority over the curse and everybody under the curse. He has power over them. You are not under the curse. The only thing that can hinder your promise is God seeing that you don't truly believe what he told you in unbelief already direct, already directly puts you under the curse. And then Satan will probably, you know, mess it up somehow because you didn't have faith. Really, it was your faith that messed it up. Satan never had any authority. You just thought he did, which is why he was able to take it away from you because you believed in Satan more than God. So it's really just um, 
I would even say it's a mind thing. It's just, uh, it's, it's very simple. Satan doesn't have any power. He doesn't have any authority. God uses him. Satan has authority over people who are wicked and under the curse. And that's it. That's literally it. Satan is a bully. He, he talks a lot of noise. He can tell you what he would like to do. He could discourage you and tell you how he would like to take your promise away, but he can, he has no authority to do so. Only if you stop believing what God told you. That's it. So, what I mean when I say your promise is bigger than you is that because it is God's secret that he shared with you, it's his word that you are just a byproduct of and you have no control over anything that God showed you. You're just since you're just pretty much waiting and just believing. You're just riding riding the wave with God. There's a lot of things incorporated into that promise that you don't know about. Really take into account that you have a lot of enemies that are watching you, and they have been following your journey. They have been following your weight. They've been following that promise that God gave you. And sometimes God will have you wait a little bit longer just to make your enemies your footstool. He, he wants to shame a lot of people who have been mocking and blaspheming his spirit through your promise. And once again, it's not your promise. It's God's promise, but he's sharing it with you, which is why it is yours, because he's giving it to you. So there's a lot of different things that play into um, something that God revealed to you. There's a lot of different elements to it. It's, it's much bigger than God just giving you something. It's much bigger than you just about to get this thing or this person that God promised you. He's about to do a lot with that word. It's a lot of things that he set up way before he even revealed that word to you. He's going to humble the wicked. He's going to humble the proud, the proud with that word. He's going to bring your enemies under your feet and make them your footstool. He's going to give glory to his name by some of those who have been uh, watching uh, or being witnesses and following your promise. So um, it can prove to them that he is who he says he is. And it's going to increase faith in, um, in him with their heart. So there's a lot of things that God is doing with that one word that you don't even know about. And um, he only reveals bits and pieces Um to you concerning that word according to what he just wants you to believe in but he doesn't tell you everything and I noticed that when I was reading Genesis with Abraham and how when God kept confirming uh his promise to Abraham in Genesis and um the promised land that he was going to give him in his seed and how he was going to give him a seed and make him a great nation a father of many nations etc etc I noticed that God told Abraham I think he showed him what the place was but he said the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full so that lets us know that um, not only does God sometimes have to remove certain people to prepare you to walk into that promised land. He wants to get everything set up in order first before he delivers that to you. But that lets me know that there was another puzzle piece to this promise all along that Abraham probably didn't know about up until that point. So God was not going to release Abraham into the promised land that he already told him was his until these certain people in this pagan nation were done or the sum of their um until their judgment the appointed time for god's judgment god has an appointed time for everything you know uh you not believing that is really gonna uh, decrease your faith in god and what he does you have to understand god is sovereign he reveals stuff to you he already has it set up in time <laughs> what he wants to do okay we just have to believe in that god operates by seasons He's not a mistaken God. He don't have no plan B's. If anything, his plan B is always interwoven in his plan A. You just didn't know it. He um he doesn't make mistakes. Okay. God has a set time and season for everything. It's just that some revelations he gives you could be to test your faith because you're still walking by sight instead of what he told you. Unless he gave you a specific date, I wouldn't even worry about it. But um Yeah, so that lets us know that um God could not release Abraham into that promised land until the iniquity or the sins of this pagan nation in that place was full according to the time that God wanted to judge that pagan nation. So that means that Abraham's promise that he was holding on to, because he probably wouldn't think about no pagan nation. He's not thinking about all of that. He's just thinking, I got this promise from God. He said he's going to make me a nation. I'm going to have a son. Um... He's going to bless the whole world through me. You know, I'm going to have this nice play, you know. So that, that's what Abraham was holding on to. That's what God wanted him to hold on to. But you see how there was another part to that promise that Abraham was not even aware of. So your promise is much bigger than you. There's a lot of stuff that God is doing that's surrounding your promise. 
and um sometimes you have to take your eyes off of yourself and your frustrations and your impatience and you getting you know just complaining and murmuring because God sees um he sees a lot higher than we do I remember I had my first encounter with God I think it was 2011 when I was really just like consecrated like I mean because at that time I was watching like bad girls club and stuff and I literally cut everything off all secular music off and I just I just I was just spending time with God still didn't really go anywhere just like I do today but I was just really in the word I was really just seeking God I was really just seeking God and um I was at my cousin's house one night and I just wanted to talk to him we weren't talking about anything important I just wanted to lay down and talk to the father and I kind of laid down and I went into a trance and it would it kind of felt like I was in between being awake and being asleep but I was definitely in a trance and I felt the presence of God and I saw fire. I saw nothing but fire. I saw two pillars as well, but that's all I saw was just fire and warmth. And it was the most boldest, strongest authority. I cannot even begin to describe to you. I could feel my spirit woman and what she was doing before this person. And I was bowed down. You automatically knew who this was. Your spirit already knew who this was. It knew to bow down. It knew to show reverence and to respect this person. It comes naturally. And I really do believe that's why Revelation says that every knee shall bow. They will bow. And they every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because your spirit already knows who he is. As soon as you get in God's presence, your spirit knows what to do. Because it came from him. And um, I, f I remember feeling that I'll never forget that experience. I haven't experienced it since. And that was uh, six years ago. But... Yeah, I felt a lot of fire. I, f I felt and saw a lot of fire, but it was like a warming fire. It wasn't like a destruction hell fire, you know. It was like a warmth, like a like a presence, you know. And I didn't know when I had that trance that the Bible says that God is a consuming fire. I saw that after the fact. I was like, wow. <laughs> so I was in God's presence. That's crazy. but And he was downloading some revelation to me. I don't even know what this was. I don't remember what he told me, but he was speaking back to me. We were just talking and we were, I guess, because I fell asleep, but our spirits were still in communion. That's what it was. I fell asleep, but I got into a trance because my spirit was still in communion with God. And um, he was downloading something into me and he was speaking to me telepathically. I didn't hear any words. And my spirit bore witness with it because I used to do Facebook ministry when I was a baby Christian. It was something that I was already speaking about ministry wise, but he gave me like a broader, more mature re revelation of what it was. And he was, it was just like this, uh, it was like we were in sync, in a trance, and nothing around us was moving, and he was just downloading all this information into my spirit. And it felt like for five seconds, I was in the mind of God, and I could feel what his mind felt like. The way he sees the world is so far beyond above, <laughs> like the way we, we are so nearsighted, it's insane. We cannot even conceive the kind of mind that God has. The best way I could describe it when I was in fellowship or communion with him, when I was in that trance, I felt like his mind was overseeing the world and his thoughts were completely different than what we would think every day. It was a lot of plans, a lot of... Um, he has his own thoughts, thoughts in his heart about us and about the world. He always has a lot of plans and things that he wants to set up and things that he's setting out to do. And I just, I kind of saw just like a broad scope of the world and it was just kind of moving, you know, just kind of moving. And he was just looking down on the earth. He does not think the way you do at all. Or that's the best way I can describe it. Like uh, when the Bible says that his thoughts are higher than yours, it was very high because I saw him looking down. But um, God's heart and mind is not our heart and mind at all. And that's really why he tries to get us into his words so that we can take on his mind and take on his heart and believe what he believes so we can see what he sees. Yeah, so when he says that um, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, they're much higher. You know, God does not do things the way that we do. He meant that. I experienced it and I felt it. And it was a wisdom that was like, I, I, I can't explain it to you. It just felt like a very broad wisdom. It was so rich. And it was just five seconds. It was so quick, but I could feel it like... It's, it's definitely not a wisdom that you can contain in your old mind. It is definitely supernatural. Um, definitely a supernatural mind. I was like, wow, we are like on two completely different realms when it comes to how we think and how God thinks. But I felt that. 
and I'll never forget that. And how I got out of the trance, I still till this day I don't know what he was um what he was instilling in my spirit or registering in my spirit. I, I really don't know. Um I think when God does that through dreams, like sometimes we have a dream and uh, it feel like the Lord just kind of put it in your spirit, but you don't really remember it. I think it's because at the appointed time when it's meant to come out, it's going to come out. So it probably already has been because he was just downloading revelations into me. And it was stuff. It was ministry wise. It was like a lot of wisdom and I already have that. So that's why I say it probably already came out, whatever it was. But um, he wouldn't tell me what it, what it was that we were talking about. And I snapped out of the trance. Is my cousin had bust into the room and she kind of woke me up and I just kind of snapped out of it. And I knew it wasn't a dream. I knew it was a trance because the way that I kind of snapped out of it was not like how you would wake out of a dream. It was kind of like a to be continued type thing. Like I was just drawn out of the spirit and he just kind of went, you know, back up. Um, It didn't end. I just got taken out of a realm that I was, uh, I was just recently engaging in. So it wasn't a dream. It didn't feel like I had just, you know, woke up out of a dream. It was definitely a trance. And um, God loves it when you spend time with him. I, I haven't experienced anything like that with him since. And um, I think he really was just enjoying spending quality time with me. And he saw that my heart was just really after him. I literally did not care about anything else. And I just wanted to just, you know, simply talk to him. I didn't know that he was going to do all of that. And he did. And he gave me that. But I just said that to say that... um God's ways are not our ways. He does not think the thoughts that we think. We like to control and manipulate God according to our nearsighted, <laughs> you know, uh, carnal minds. And it's, it's just God thinks way bigger than what you think. You're not even capable of thinking big the way God does and the plans that he has for you. He'd have to bring you into his mind to do that. And he's done that through giving you his word. The more that you renew your mind with the word of God, I feel like it's kind of you setting chairs and tables in place so Jesus can come and sit down and, you know, speak with you and share with you what his plans are. You have to fashion your mind to um, receive the things of God, if that makes sense. And it can only do that if it's in alignment with his word. You have to change your mind first. So it's possible for us to have it. We're not going to have like the, the mind of God, like, you know, in full wisdom. He'll give us bits and pieces. But just so we can be in alignment with his will and uh, his spirit um, and walk according to what he's, you know, things that he set out to do and to happen in the kingdom. You know, you have to put on the mind of Christ. But your promise is so much bigger than you. It's, it's, it's way bigger than you. Um, God is very happy that you're a part of it. He's happy that he shared it with you. He hap He's happy that, you know, you get encouraged by it. You get excited, you know. But when we start, you know, making it about us, to get when we get frustrated and start murmuring and complaining, it frustrates God because you can't see what he sees. You're just looking at yourself and your circumstances. And he's telling you, look beyond that. Look bigger. This is so much bigger than you. I'm going to do so much stuff with this one word that I gave you. You only know, like, this much <laughs> with this word. Your responsibility is to continue believing that word. When God encourages you about that word through a dream or a vision, continue believing it is to encourage your heart. But as far as everything else, that's his business. That's his you know, responsibility to worry about all the details and stuff. You just believe what God told you. Hold on to it. It's, it's your baby. You're literally pregnant with the word of God. Uh, people will try to come and terminate your pregnancy. Satan will use spirits to do so. Satan will use people. Um... Like I said, keep them to the curb. But, yes. So, that's one thing he really put in my spirit was your enemies. You have a lot of enemies. Some enemies you probably don't even know about. It could be your family. It could be friends. It could be people you've never met, don't know anything about. But they are enemies to God's promise in your life. And sometimes what he told me, your weight it's not because God is really prolonging, you know, your promise or manifesting that thing. It's bigger than you and he's doing a lot of different things with that one word. And one thing he loves to do is to shame your enemies with that word. He does it purposely. So it's not just about you. It's about him shaming your enemies to give glory unto his name, to exalt you by the spirit. Not you exalting yourself, but he's going to exalt you because they've been mocking you. They've been blaspheming you. They've been blaspheming the spirit of God through you. God has to take care of all that stuff. He has to give you the, the promise, the prosperity, the blessing, the chastisement and judgment on different people who are collectively a part of this one word all at once. So you can't just make it about you when it's not just about you. It's God's word and his, his promise is given to you 
But sometimes that word is given to, it's implanted in you to become impregnated by so that when it finally manifests and gives birth, it can shame your enemies. God will do that. It's, it's justice. God does that for us. Now, I wouldn't say set your heart on that because it, that could probably defile your heart and your conscience with God. You just want God to judge all your enemies and stuff. He's going to do it regardless. It's not something you really have to pray for. He can see... Um, People who are conspiring against you. You can see people who are uh, doing word curses about that word and uh, mocking you. And he can see all of that stuff. So sometimes your weight is because God really wanted to build up to a head. And he's going to give his his quote that he loves to give me in uh, Exodus. When Moses went to him, he's like, well, Lord, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's not listening to me. And now, now the Israelites, now they're complaining because they just gave them even more tasks. And God completely ignored everything he just said. And he said, now watch and see what I'm about to do to Pharaoh. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just amazing. Like, God wasn't even trying to hear what Moses was saying. He was excited for what he was about to do. Like, I know I did that purposely. So, all God cares about that build up. God will, God will let that word wait and wait and wait until the right time where everything is perfect, perfectly set in place. Now you're prepared to walk into the promised land. Now every, everybody's heart, everything has uh, has happened. All these things have transpired with all these different kinds of vessels of honor and dishonor. Certain timings, things have taken place. Now, this is when um this is when he's really about to blow everybody's mind. And some people, it's not going to be in a good way. They're going to be shamed because it's your enemies. That's how God makes your enemies your footstool. So what I would say to you about your promise, I feel like the reason why a lot of people cannot stay encouraged about their promise is because they really make it about them a lot. We make it about us so much and it's yours, you know, and I definitely receive it because it's a gift. I mean, it's, you can't lose it unless you just don't believe it altogether or just try to walk away from God or something. But don't make it so much about you to the point where you kind of blind yourself from seeing a little bit further concerning what that word is going to be used for that God may have not revealed to you. Just believe him, trust him, what he's doing. Sometimes he may give you a little insight on that, on what he's planning to do with that word in terms of your enemies. But um, just sit still, just wait, just rest. When God tells you to pray, pray. When God tells you to do warfare, warfare. And that's one thing he had to teach me about warfare when it comes to you warring for that promise. You are not warring against the enemy for victory. You have victory. You are warring from victory. The promise is already done. It's already done. God has to manifest it here through the realm of time. So when God tells us to pray for something or somebody, that's a part of that promise too, or he tells you to warfare against the enemy, it's because he has already he's, he's, he's already anointed you or appointed you to be used to bring it to pass. Not so that it can come to pass, because God's word is going to come to pass regardless. If he tells you to pray and to do warfare throughout this process of waiting for this word of this promise, it's because he already chose you before he even gave you the promise to be used as a vessel to help that come to pass, if that makes sense. You were already incorporated into it to be used as a tool, basically. You're not fighting for victory. Satan has no victory. He's condemned. He's defeated. You're fighting from victory. In other words... I mean, in the old, it's already in the Old Testament. Like, I'm not saying anything. It's not already in the Bible. God would tell them he was going to do something. They were down with it. They believed it. He said, okay, go fight this battle so it can be done. Okay, we fighting. They weren't fighting to get the land from the people. They fought because God already gave it to They already, He already gave the land to them. He already gave uh, their enemies into their hand. They just took action on that word, but it was already done. They understood that. God spoke it. It's already done. I just have to go take it and possess it. That's it. So you taking and possessing it sometimes is your warfare. Sometimes that is your prayer. I'm not fighting to take it because God told me it's mine. I'm taking it because it is mine. <laughs> you know, same thing with deliverance. You're already delivered. You're already healed. You just have to receive it by faith and take it. It's yours. We need to stop asking God for stuff that we already have. Like, God, please give me this pen, Lord. Like, you got the pen. Just pick it, pick the pen up. Pick the pen up. It's right here, <laughs> you know. Stop asking me for stuff that I already gave you. Um. So, yeah. <sighs> Satan is a master manipulator. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a magician. He can play on your mind like crazy, which is why you have to guard it with faith in the word of God. That's the only thing. Satan is very smart. He's very intellectual, but he's also under the curse. That means that his witchcraft can only work on a cursed mindset. 
It can't work on the mind of Christ. So outside of Christ, everything Satan does can look so big and just so magnificent and so many different layers and darkness of witchcraft and all. So yeah, 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 he, he has a lot of power, but only people who are under the curse over them, not over us, not those who believe. It pales. It can't do anything. It pales in comparison to the power of Jesus Christ. We have the victory in Christ. Satan cannot touch your promise. All he can do is play witchcraft mind games on you to get you to believe what he believes so you can stop believing what God believes. And we know that only things manifest if we believe what God believes. So choose your path. You can have a path of unbelief and what Satan is saying and all this false discouragement, false prophecies, false prophets and witnesses. Or you're going to believe what God said. It's very simple. You choose what's going to manifest in your life. You choose it. You know, Moses told them, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. You choose. I'm either going to believe God and pursue him with my whole heart. I'm going to believe Satan and all these doubt, doubts and fears and confusions and lies. Okay, well, that's, going, that's what's going to manifest in your life. You choose that. Yeah, there's a devil. Yes, there's a God. You know, New Age people like to say, well, you know, well, we speak and we like to we choose what manifests. Well, they're right. But they're taking the attention off of the fact that there are two divine beings who are, you know, uh, have authority over those things. Satan has power. He does have authority, but only over those under the curse. You got delivered from the curse when you chose to believe in the gospel through faith in Jesus Christ. He has no power over you. Satan can only come and play mind games with you. That's it. To get you to stop believing. He can't touch anything that belongs to you. He can get you to believe that he can. And that's what gives him the power to do so. It's very simple. He likes to philosophize and make things, make things really deep. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter, you know, because as long as you have faith, faith is really simple. Jesus is really, he's a simple God. He makes it very easy for you. Satan makes things complex. There's always layers to stuff. I mean, God uses layers too, but Satan does it to just really mess you up in the mind. And he can't do anything. He's literally like a dog on the other side, other side of this glass who's barking at you. It's a transparent glass, so it gives off the illusion that he could come and attack you, but he really can't. He's just kind of on the other side. He's trying to get you to come to the other side, <laughs> you know, so he can touch you. He can't do anything. He wishes he could. He wishes he could. He expresses that to you through false dreams, through false visions, through discouragement, through attacks. He expresses to you because he wishes he could. And once you experience that attack and you start believing, oh my God, he can touch me. Well, that's what gives him permission to touch you. He knows he has to get your faith. That's, uh, that's all Satan has to do is get a Christian's faith. And he can manifest everything he's ever wanted to do in your life. It's a faith thing. Other than that, I would not listen to him. I, I wouldn't listen to anything Satan has to say. He's annoying. He never stops talking. He's obnoxious. And he's delusional. And he's deceived. You wish you could touch me. But you can't. Because I believe God, I believe his word, I believe his promise, and I'm obedient to God. I'm submitted to God. You can't touch me. He's annoying. Now, Ezekiel 14. <sighs> Back to why you should not be dependent on people for your word. You believe what God told you for that word, and that's it. Now, this context is about idols in your heart. I'm not talking about idols right now. I just want to show you how if God sees that your heart, people can be your idol. You are making people... God in your life. You need a middleman for stuff. You don't need no middleman. The Lord said you don't need any man to teach you anything. You have the anointed one inside of you to teach you all things that Jesus said to you, the Holy Spirit, and then some. God uses people through the Holy Spirit. They are just carriers and vessels for the Spirit of God to bear witness to you and confirm to you what God told you. You don't go through man to get to God. God goes through man to get to you. Stop running to people for confirmations, for encouragement, for all this different stuff that you should only get from the Lord. They can't help you. They're either going to be used by the Lord or by the enemy. And we're about to read that in Ezekiel 14. <sighs> then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? So here we see God does not even have any intentions on listening to somebody who's praying to him, who is praying from an um, idolatrous heart. That should scare you. That should scare you if God can see in your heart that you're more dependent on man than you are on him. He will purposely deceive you for doing that. 
So here he's saying in verse 3, he does not even want to hear anything that you have to say to him. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them who have the idols in their heart and that stumbling block of uh, iniquity. Thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that sets up his idols in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, their eyes are not set on the Lord, their eyes are set on what they want. And comes to the prophet, they went to man. They didn't go to God for it, they went to man. I, the Lord, will answer him that comes according to the multitude of his idols. God will tell you exactly what you want to hear if he can see in your heart that you really don't want to know the truth when you come to him. You went to a man. It's the same thing we talk about when we talk about different topics like the head covering and makeup. I mean, it really does not matter what it's about. The, the point is, a lot of reasons why people cannot receive those revelations from the spirits because God can see in their hearts they don't really want it. So if you go to God, God, can I still wear makeup? God, can I have that perfume back? Or God, can I go date him anyway? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You know? You know what they're going to say? Well, sis, God told me, I believe you. I believe he did tell you, yeah. But here in Ezekiel, he's saying that he also answers us according to the idols in our hearts. He will purposely deceive you because he knows that you don't want the truth. You want a lie from God. You're not seeking God's heart to learn his ways and to learn his truth. And for his will so that you can pursue what he wants, you're trying to use witchcraft with the Lord. You're trying to manipulate him into telling you what you want him to tell you. That's not God. He says, I, the Lord, will answer him that comes to this man, to this prophet, according to the multitude of his idols, according to the desires of his heart, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart. He's going to ensnare you by the lusts and desires of your own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, repent. And turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. You see how they didn't go to God directly. They went to the prophet. Now, all the, uh, back in the Old Testament, that probably was the way they actually did things. That was their custom, but it's the same thing today. People in the same spirit today. They want to run to man for answers. They want to run to articles for answers instead of going directly to the Holy Spirit. Because they know that if they seek God about that, he's going to tell them the blunt truth about it. So they run to man because they have itching ears. They don't want to hear what thus saith the Lord. They want to hear somebody who comes in the name of God so they can still be comfortable in their sin. <laughs> this is really pathetic. You don't want to do that. But um, comes to the prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man. And I will make him a sign and a proverb. I will make him an example. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing. So the man that you went to in the name of God to get an answer from God. If that man be deceived when he has spoken a thing, when he responded to you, okay, well, sis, the Lord revealed to me, okay. I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeks unto him. That the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. Give me a second. Sorry, I had to get my kale because I had made some kale. <laughs> but in terms of this message, um, so you can just see the danger. God does not play when it comes to your heart. He can see what the intentions of your heart are when you come to him about something. Or um, when you have no intentions on seeking God in his ways, you just want something from him. And um, it's very scary, but the Lord will actually do that. So I personally know a sister who said that uh, she had a prophet constantly prophesying all these things to her. And it was not God because she really wanted to do that thing so bad. And um, God will do that. So the last thing that you want to do 
is keep going. And I've seen a lot of sisters in terms of word of marriage. I have seen so many women deceive, so many women deceive by a word of marriage that they really believe they have when they are divorced, been married two, three, four times, and are still convinced that God has promised them some spouse. You want to know why they got that word? This right here. Crazy thing about, I, I, I mean, several of them. I, I've, I've encountered so many, so many sisters like that. And I said, you know, it's either one or two things. Because Jezebel, she can give revelations too. But you really need, you will not be able to uh, test a revelation uh, from Jezebel unless you have the Holy Spirit. That's something that's completely spiritually discerned. You can forget about it. It's nothing logical or intellectual behind it. You have to have the Holy Spirit to really test when a word is from God or a demonic spirit. Because it could, Jezebel is very, uh, she's very fluent in revelations as well. But a lot of it is just demonic witchcraft. So I encountered a lot of these sisters and... I know it's the one that would talk to them on the phone a couple years ago because we were encouraging each other about our word of marriage. They all seem to be divorced. I mean, they, they all had their own excuse. One one was saying how, uh, God, she always knew this is her husband, but she had gotten married and I think he was divorced too and now. So they both were divorced and God supposedly gave her this promise with this man. Another sister was saying, well, that wasn't the man that God chose for me. She married somebody when she was in the world. Now they're divorced. I'm just like... I knew what God's word said about it. I just could not understand where are they getting all these revelations from? Because it would be stuff the Holy Spirit would tell me about my husband. And we were all on Facebook and it would just be flowing. Like they would be flowing in it, honey. Like flowing in the prophetic. I said, something is not right. I said, they're either not really saved. And this is Jezebel, which I did discern that spirit on a lot of those women. Or it could be, and I don't want to put her out there, but anointed fire youtube channel is another one of them i think that woman that sister has been married twice or three times and she's always making videos about marriage and a word of marriage and how she's still seeking god for her mate god's not going to send her a mate i think it's very odd for somebody to continually obsessively post videos about marriage when they don't even have a word of marriage i don't even think she has one she just posts about it a lot and this is why god will do that sometimes god will give you all those revelations he'll give you all that stuff because god probably told those women no you can't remarry that's not my will and you know we don't know that they could be ignoring the lord and they still want that so he goes ahead and he gives it to them he's gonna lead you into that false marriage and it's gonna be your destruction because you didn't you didn't obey his voice i hope my phone don't fall yeah I, i'm not trying to put this so on blast i just um i just found it it makes me uncomfortable because a lot of the revelations that anointed fire gets on her channel it's stuff that god has told me personally and that leads me to believe sometimes they could really be true sisters sometimes they really could have the holy spirit to be getting those revelations but this is one part in scripture people don't like to um receive they they kind of just discard that you have to acknowledge that you got to be able to test everything because sometimes god will give people that word he can use them to encourage the people who really have the word, which is just crazy how God does that. All those women on Facebook who were uh, divorced and believed they had a road of marriage, they would give, God was basically using them to give me crazy signs and confirmations, like crazy rhema words from my word. And um, the Lord can do that. He will do that. He will use people who have idolatry in their hearts. He'll use them as basically like a, um, a slot machine. A slot machine for revelations, a slot machine for rhema words, for encouragement. He will use them through their idolatry just to encourage you who really has the word. He will do that. And um, sometimes that's really what it is. A lot of us, we just make things like that an idol. God probably told them, and that's something that you don't know. You would have to go to the Lord and ask him that because you shouldn't be following anybody. Number one, it's idolatry. That's already adultery in the heart. If this, if this woman is divorced and the word of God says that a divorced woman should not remarry, that uh, remarriage is adultery and you have the sister in Christ who keeps talking about how she wants a husband, a husband, a husband. Well, that's adultery in the heart. And following that, if she's not submitting to the word of God, which I actually did confront her about that, she never responded to me. Um, she just kept sending me back to these video links that she made. And I'm like, I don't want to watch your videos. You're under the impression you're deceived. <laughs> I'm trying to help you, you know, but, um, you really have to test stuff like that because there could be a situation where that woman of God does have the Holy Spirit, but her heart is not right with the Lord and she's deceived. And that's who you're listening to. She's deceived by a false word. It could be the Jezebel spirit or it could be God giving her that. But once again, God just told us sometimes he will deceive us himself because we had idolatry in our hearts. And how can you know whether you're being deceived by God or whether it's really a true word from God you can really trust? But where's your heart at? Is there idolatry in your heart when it comes to that word or with that promise? Did God already tell you no before? 
and you still were pursuing it, then all of a sudden you got this random word, this revelation of encouragement that you wanted to believe and you hold fast to that? Is your heart more more concerned about, you know, God's will and God's heart? And then you receive this promise and this byproduct from God because you truly love him. Or did you want something more than him and you kept begging him for it and he finally gave you what you wanted to hear? He did the same thing with Balaam. Because I think uh, I think it was a certain king. I could be mistaken. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. A certain pagan nation, they really wanted to curse Israel because Israel was passing through their country to get to the promised land. And they were asking Balaam to curse them. And every time that Balaam would go to God... Um, I know it's two I know it's Balak and Balaam. I'm, I think it's Balaam. Every time Balaam would go to God on behalf of Israel, asking whether he could curse them, God would say, "No, you cannot curse these people. They are blessed and not cursed, not because of their obedience, but because of God's uh, relationship to their forefathers and uh, His faithfulness to them." So God is still fulfilling His promises to you even after you die with your seed. That's a faithful God. And finally, Balaam came to God. I think the third time after God told him no twice. And he said, yeah, go ahead and do it. Go ahead for money. Go ahead and do it. So Balaam's heart, he was a prophet. Balaam was a real prophet. But God deceived him because his heart was not right. He wanted money. He wanted favor with those people. And he was trying to get that favor through trying to get permission from God to curse Israel when God already told him, no, you cannot curse Israel. And there's not a reason for you to do so. I think that's actually in Numbers because uh, that's the scripture where because people ask, well, can a Christian be cursed by witches? A Christian can only be cursed by a witch if God allows it to be so. If there's a reason for you to be cursed, meaning if there's some kind of disobedience that you're in, yeah, God will probably allow that to come to pass. But Satan or a witch, nobody from the kingdom of darkness can touch you unless it has to go through God first. So even if you did endure some kind of witchcraft curse, it would be by the hand of the Lord anyway to whoop you, basically. Witches cannot touch a Christian. They have to go through Satan first. Satan has to go through God first. And you should already make sure that your relationship is intact with God so that he wouldn't permit something like that to come, on, uh, come upon you in the first place. So even if you were to be cursed by a witch, it would be your fault. They're not around here just doing what they want to do. They're slaves to Satan, and Satan is a slave to God. God is your daddy, who you're responsible to submit to and obey. So I would not be worried about any witchcraft or curses unless you're in disobedience somewhere. But, um, so yeah, God, um, God deceived Balaam. Balaam was a prophet and he deceived him. As soon as he got what he finally wanted to hear from the Lord, although the Lord already told him no twice. And sometimes I think God will go ahead and he'll confirm and convict you about that particular thing twice just so you know for a fact that this was really his voice. But if he sees in your heart that you still really want that thing and you keep begging God, well, can I just have it, God? Can I just compromise? You know, well, can I, can I just get married anyway, God? You don't want to accept that word. In Matthew, Luke, and Mark about adultery, you don't want to accept that word. Oh, yeah, God's going to deceive you. It may not even be the enemy who told you. It could have been God himself who told you that, but he's deceiving you through the lust of your own heart. That should scare everybody. That should really put a fear of God in all of our hearts. That sometimes, because we always say, oh, that's from the enemy, that's from the enemy. Sometimes it's not the enemy, sometimes it's God. He uses the enemy to deceive you. So sometimes they can be hearing from the Lord, but how would you know if it's because of idolatry in their heart or because if it's a pure word from the Holy Spirit? You have to ask. You gotta. You gotta. You really gotta test the spirits with stuff. Everybody's not a sister, and if they are, they could be in rebellion. How would you know? You know. So um. That word. Is why I would not run to man while you are waiting for your promise. Or concerning a promise that you want, or something that you do want to receive from God, and He's told you no. Um. Or maybe something contrary and you keep going back and forth to God, going back and forth for that word after he's already made it clear to you. I think God, he may be confirming several times to you what his true answer is just to make sure that you know when it really gets rooted in your heart. But, you know, we still like to be disobedient, still like to be rebellious and still come to him anyway and we pursue our own lust. Which is what I think he did recently with that keto diet that I was on. Because God already told me last year... Which I actually did share with y'all in a video that he wanted me on a plant-based diet. That was the best diet for me. Um, I had an idol of uh, weight loss in my heart, obviously. And I didn't want to do that. I was still trying to find roundabout ways to lose weight and go around what God told me. And um, water fasting. I was tempted to water fast anyway because that was the quickest way that I would ever lose weight. 
And God told me two times in scripture to stop water fasting. He told me to stop doing it, never do it again. And I still tried it. <laughs> I still tried the Lord. I, I, I never ended up actually doing it. I, I just, it was a thought in my mind, but I was so scared of God and what he may allow to happen to me. Since he already told me no twice with water fasting, I would never actually go through with it. And, um, yeah, the keto diet. So God actually did lead me to the ketogenic diet, <laughs> which is so funny. That's why I say it was gentle correction from him. I don't think he did it to whoop me. I think he did it as correction because I already told you I wanted you on a plant-based diet and you still ignored me. And because you have, uh, you're being vain about it, you care more about your appearance, Brandy, and your looks more than you do about my temple and uh, your health. So yeah, God did lead me to that keto diet. And everything that I expected, everything that I wanted, you know, to happen, how the word says, you know, their expectations shall be ashamed. I didn't lose any weight. I felt like crap. I wasted three months on this diet when nothing happened for me. Um, just for the Lord to gently, you know, lead me back to what he originally put in my heart the first time. So don't think that God will not correct you according to your idols. He will do that. It may not be as brutal as it would with something a little bit more serious. It really depends on that person's heart and what it is. For this, I think it was just gentle correction. He's just leading me because he knows how insecure I am about stuff like that. And how Jezebel torments, torments me about stuff like that, like my appearance and stuff. That's a part of her witchcraft. So I think for him, he was really just, um, I'm just going to let her do it. <laughs> She's not going to listen to me anyway. I'm going to just let her go ahead and see how do you feel in this diet. Does it feel like life? Does it feel like vitality? Does it feel like anything that is me? No. It feels like trash. It's obviously not of me then. Why would God have you on a diet that's consuming everything disgusting i mean has no no like i said no nutritional value nothing he put on this earth for you to eat and you really think of this god it's not the lord but he can deceive you he can allow you to think that just to correct you god will lead you in the way of your idols just to correct you and whoop you and lead you back to him which is why he said in verse 11 verse 11 that the house of israel may go no more astray from me neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God. So he just told you the reason for deceiving them, for correction. So, <sighs> Satan is not God. He's no authority figure. God uses so many different spirits and so many different people and so many different things to ensnare you because your heart is not right towards him. You can be in this place of derision and delusion and confusion and just fear if you want to, but you wouldn't have to worry about that if your heart was right with the Lord. You wouldn't have to worry about God trying to deceive you or anything because he would see in your heart, she loves me. Her heart is on me first. She's not worried about all these external things. And then he'll bless you with those things, you know. Like he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. You don't seek things first from God. You seek God first, and then he blesses you with those things. Once he sees that they will not tear, um, turn your heart away from him. So um, people, I would not run to people concerning your promise for anything, especially since you just read how God can see that you have people as an idol or your pastor as an idol or your spiritual mom, which is not even biblical. Um, it could be it could be a spiritual type. We can be a spiritual mother figure to certain uh, believers, but that has to be ordained by the Lord. All oh, that religious man-made mess, that's not God. Um, you're more dependent on these people for your word and for your relationship with God than you are God. And he will allow you to be deceived through that doctrine. He will allow you to be deceived through that false church. He will. You don't put anybody or anything before the Lord. He will do it just to correct you. And sometimes that correction may not always be a gentle correction. It may not be like a little keto diet mishap with me. It could be you actually going through this church doctrine and you getting severely hurt by those people there. And find out that they were just a bunch of wolves in the first place. So it may not always be a gentle correction. It could be a harsh correction for you. Because you should have sought the Lord first before those people. Or before your own ways. So you know that relationship is going to hurt you. Because you knew it wasn't God's will but you got into it anyway. You ignored the Lord. You knew what God's will was. You knew who your wife was. You knew who your husband was. And you married this person anyway. Or you got into a relationship and a soul tie with this person anyway. And you got hurt, didn't you? That's what it's talking about. Oh, I believe God blessed me with this person. Okay. <laughs> I, I sure would like to know. Like, I'd, I'd like to know. It may have been God, but was it was, it, was, it, was his right hand or his left hand? <laughs> Look, we want to be on the right. Well, y'all's right. We want to be on the right hand. I don't want no judgment from the Lord. But, um... <sighs> 
make sure that your heart is perfect before God. Try. To, it's not wrong to want things from the Lord. It's in his heart to bless you. It's in his heart to prosper us. We just have to trust that God is going to do that if we give him our hearts first. That's your responsibility as a Christian is to make sure that you want God more than anything else here. And if that is straight, you ain't got to worry about nothing else. It's because it's going to start coming and flowing naturally in your life. As long as you keep Jesus the center here, right here. I'm personally scared of being deceived. I hate being deceived. Sometimes I know when I am being deceived because I know when I'm being disobedient with something, with something you know. So I think he really does weigh it according to who the person is, what the idolatry is, and how serious it is, you know, when it comes to how he's going to correct them through it. But, and like I said, he's a dad, so he will use it to correct you. He'll allow you to go down that false path just to whoop you and see, that was not me. I told you that, <laughs> you know, but... For other people, um, for the wicked who are hardening their hearts against God's word and they know what his word says, um, like like I said, woe unto them. That's what the scripture says. I don't want to be on that team. I'm already a kid and I'm one of the, the stiff necks ones. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm already kind of getting dealt with by the Lord with different stuff. I don't want to be on nobody else's team. I don't want to be on the left hand with nothing, okay? But um, what else can I tell you about your promise? When you get to when you get to phase three or trimester three, your promise date is gonna start throwing so many stuff at you to discourage you and have you. Um, and God's gonna give you a word test, which is very. Uh, I think it's why I pulled out Ezekiel fourteen too. He's gonna give you a word test. He's gonna give a sister in Christ or a brother in Christ a dream that's contrary to what he told you, or he'll send somebody to say something contrary. Everything around you, your circumstances look contrary to what he's been showing and telling you and confirming in your spirit. And God will purposely do that to test that word in your heart to see is she gonna believe what I told her or is she gonna believe this sister's dream over here? Ain't nothing wrong with the sister, she ain't do nothing wrong. Like I said, God will sometimes he'll do that on purpose just to test your heart to see if you're going to believe it um continue believing what he told you over what man says and at the end of the day that's really what it all boils down to i don't care how saved they are <laughs> you know god can still use his daughters and his sons like i said that dream could come from god and be delivered to you just to test you and if it's contrary to what god showed you and told you that's that's a word test god wants you to pass it okay so um Yes, trimester three of the promise, Satan's going to throw everything at you. I mean, it's, it's going to be so much opposition towards this word. You're going to be questioning, did I really hear God? And you know you heard God, you know. Yes, you know, he's doing it purposely. He's doing this to me right now. <laughs> so um, he'll do that with certain dates and times and something, you know. Like, um, just believe what God put in your spirit and let him manifest your promise how he chooses to do so. Your responsibility is to continue believing the hope that's it forget everything else forget everything else believe what he told you showed you and confirmed to you period that's it if you want to walk into your promised land and you want to obtain your promise from God you have to walk in by faith and remove every hindrance and stumbling block that could potentially prevent you from walking into that promise sometimes it's people Sometimes it could just be distractions. It could be anything, anything that's hindering that word, that seed that God put in your heart from bearing fruit for you to walk into this blissfully full. I mean, full fledged faith. I would really ignore it and I would get rid of it if you can. If it's family and you're around them, you probably can't get rid of that. I have been dealing with this with my family. They all think I'm crazy when it comes to my promise that I'm waiting on God for. It's a very discouraging feeling. And these, some of those people may actually be the naysayers that God is going to um, make their expectation ashamed. Because they think you're stupid. They're looking at you foolishly. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Let me take a bite of this kale because it just smells so good right now. Mm-mm-mm. Sorry. This is so good. I forgot what I was going to say. My nose is itchy. What was I going to say? 
I was talking about your family. What's I going to say? Okay, let me let me kind of go back. I was talking about how I've been personally discouraged and accused of being crazy. That's the yeah, I was gonna say. Okay, good. Um, a lot of y'all not gonna like this because a lot of y'all are wolves watching this video and you're goats. You're not real sheep. <laughs> okay, God's bread, the children's bread, deliverance, healing promises blessings and prosperity is for the sheep it's for god's people who are really and truly converted truly born again really have the holy spirit and who really know his voice it's not for religious people it's not for churchianity people it's not for people who are bound to man-made traditions and religions who don't have any authentic real intimate relationship with the lord jesus christ these are the main people that you will find that will accuse your word of being false because they don't know God. I want that to seek into your conscience as you are hearing me say it right now. They can't perceive your promise. They can't understand. They can't believe your words or God's words to you because they don't know his voice. It's not going to bear witness with their spirit. Do not waste your time with these people. They can't even understand. You know how the word says, you know, the... The world does not know the Holy Spirit. They've never seen him, never seen him or known him because they're not born again. It takes faith. So only the body, the family of God, I should say, are the only ones who are really in the loop when it comes to certain revelations that God gives us, certain rhema word. And we know that. The Bible says that we are we're our culture within a culture. We are our own culture, our own DNA, our own family, our own bloodline in this world. We're in it, not of it. We may be from a, a certain culture in the flesh, but we have our own Jesus culture in the spirit. So a lot of things that God has you in the loop on spiritually concerning promises he's giving you and revelations he's giving you, everybody's not going to be hip to it because they're not in the spirit like that or they don't belong to him at all. So the main people that you will find accusing Cinderella is her stepmother, her two wicked sisters, and every other relative and every other family who thinks you're just crazy and you're delusional. Well, okay, everybody thought Abraham was crazy. I mean, this is basic stuff we can look at in scripture. Everybody thought Noah was crazy. It's the same thing today. Their minds are upside down. They don't have the mind of Christ for a paradigm. So how could they possibly perceive spiritual things from God? They can't. Don't even be discouraged by what they think or what they say. Because when God manifests that thing, you know what's going to happen? That lid going to blow right off their head. And it's going to give all glory to God. And hopefully... It really plants a seed of faith in their heart when they see that your promise actually manifested. But as far as discouragement goes, I wouldn't be discouraged by naysayers because they can't perceive spiritual things anyway. They can't see. How are they going to tell you what you should see when they can't see? <laughs> they can't see it? I mean, I don't want to see what you see. You're in darkness. I want to see, but all I see is what God told me, what he showed me. And the more that he continues to speak to me, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Why would I want to see what you see when all you see is darkness? We both going to be blind, you know, is look. That's all I wanted to say though. Um they don't have spiritual ears to hear, they don't have spiritual eyes to see, they don't know your Lord. Stop thinking that everybody who comes in the name of God is a Christian. Cuz a Christian is his bride. People who actually know him intimately. That's a very small remnant. It ain't everybody, okay? It's not. You have to discern that. Stop expecting every Christian to be in agreement with the promise that God gave you. And sometimes they could be really true Christians. God, like I say, just meant it, not give them the grace to believe with you. But he will send the right people to be witnesses for you. But the main people that you will find accusing and mocking that word, mocking you, waiting on that word, when it doesn't look like anything God said, it's going to be your family. It's going to be the religious folk. Religious folk. They're good for it. Um... <laughs> then once God manifests it, like some of it, God already showed me in a dream. When it happens, they're just going to be like, <laughs> you know, he's been showing me that. So, uh, like I said, that goes back to uh, Zechariah. Their expectations shall be ashamed. Because they thought you were stupid the whole time. This is not everybody. Not everybody feels that way. But most of them. 
you know, God always gone. He got to fulfill the parable. He got to fulfill the whole Disney story. So he got to put the enemies there. He got to have, you know, the prince. He got to have all that stuff. So whoever wants to play the part of the enemy, God will go ahead and use them. And he's going to judge them for it, too, because they accused you. They mocked you. They thought you were stupid. They uh, probably slandered you, gossip about you behind your back. They did all that stuff. And then once God manifests that promise, everybody's going to look down. It's not that bad. <laughs> I'm just saying it's just how the Lord works because he knows who your enemies are better than you do. And that will be their reaction when he finally manifests that promise. And when God brings you into your promised land, they're going to want a piece of it. And they're not going to be able to walk in because they didn't walk in through the front door. They tried to come in through the back door like Satan likes to do, like the thief likes to do. If you want to walk into the promised land and God's prosperity, you need to walk into the front door like I did. Relationship. Obedience. Be proven. Be tested. Be trained. Be prepared. Stop trying to bite off everybody else's prosperity. That's the multitude that walked away from Jesus when they saw him uh, blessing them with uh, the fish and the loaves of bread. And once he stopped doing those miracles, they left. <laughs> like, whatever. Bye. <laughs> it's just... It was nice knowing you, you know. And he was left with his real friends, but well, one of them, well, 11 of them. But, um, no. Everybody's not trying to go where you are in God. That's going to be my last final word before I end this video. Everybody's not trying to go where you are. Everybody's not going to walk into their calling and their purpose and their destiny because they don't have a relationship. Everybody does not want to surrender to the Lord. They don't want the intimacy. or They don't want to do what it takes to get to that place where you have gotten with God and where God is still continuously taking you. But when they see him manifest his blessing in your life, because some of them are watching you. I know I got people watching me. I know I have family watching my channel who are waiting to see what's going to happen. And they're going to try to want to bite and munch off of your prosperity, and it's not going to happen. Just in case you did not know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay? Abraham-style, full-fledged, remove yourself from these people and walk into God's new season for your life and transition into this new promise and blessing that he has for you and leave the old wide skins where they belong. If they want to become new wine skins, they will put them on. That's how I feel about that. That is it for waiting on your promise. It's not about you. It's bigger than you. Just simply believe God's word. Purify your heart. Faith is a pure heart. Unbelief is a dirty heart. Get in the word if you're having trouble with God's uh, word or believing it. Um, don't focus on naysayers. They're going to be shocked has nothing to do with you. Let God deal with those people when your promise manifests how he wants to deal with it. Let let him do that. You may you may be a witness to what happens. <laughs> I I just care about the promise. I just want to walk into the promised land. I don't really care about God making I I want God to make my enemies my footstool, but my heart is not really just like, yeah, let's show them. Yeah, yeah, show them God. You know, like I don't care. I wanna just want to get away from you to be honest. <laughs> so um Keep your heart pure before the Lord. Excited about his promises and just trust that because he is just, that promise is going to slay your enemies and all of their misconceptions about you. He's faithful to do that. That is God's way of defending you. When you went through that whole season not having anybody to defend you and your word, he going to defend his word by manifesting it right in front of him. And then we can see who gets the last laugh. We all know who gets the last laugh, right? God does. It's in Revelation. We already know the end of the story. Okay? I hope y'all enjoyed this word. Y'all have a blessed day. I'm about to eat my kale. Goodbye.